Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I know we meet you at the very end of our first day, but it's been a very interesting first day. We've had a very diverse uh, range of discussions across various industries. And um, what's interesting is I'd like to sort of draw back to what Xenia just in introduced our panel as. And uh, one thing she mentioned is that AI is no longer a buzzword, which I think all of our panelists, all of you would agree that AI is no longer something that uh, you, know, you just do for the keywords on search engine optimization trends and so on. And um, AI has become very real. AI has become um, a key part of businesses. Everybody's talking about AI um, from news publications to IT services firms to the entertainment sector, cybersecurity, um, investors. One of the, some of the biggest investors are looking at AI as a very viable uh, field to invest in. And uh, with that, we have uh, a wonderful range of speakers on our panel today. And uh, I'd in fact want to start with Akrit. Um, Akrit, so you run Haptic. Haptic, of course, is a converse, con cons conversational automation platform. And uh, you guys have been in this business for a while. Um, in fact, probably I would say a little just about at the time when AI, the buzzword kind of rose in the industry. So if you could talk us through a little bit on your journey through how you've seen AI evolve in terms of your clients as well as your offerings, to a point where today AI is perhaps growing beyond just being a buzzword into something that can actually help businesses improve their revenue. Yeah, hello. Um, thanks for having me. Um, so uh, I think uh, we started in 2013 um, and somebody said this very well the other day that one way to summarize uh, my uh, uh, journey would be 10 years too early. Uh, you know, we start, tried to basically build ChatGPT in 2013. Right. Uh, you know, which uh, uh, to some may sound uh, very visionary, to me it sounds very foolish now. Um, and uh, I think that should give you a sense of what's happened since the time what I say AI 1.0 happened, which is in the early 2010s when there was enough data for us to build neural nets and natural language understanding systems, to today uh, where we didn't imagine a world, uh, at least I didn't imagine it so soon, uh, where there'll be the concept of uh, large language models or large action models that can actually reason and complete tasks. Um, I think, again, just Thinking about then and now, um, back then, it genuinely was a buzzword. AI was a buzzword. And buzzword means uh, uh, any uh, consumers or buyers of AI, whether it was investors, your end consumers, or even your corporate customers, uh, treated it like an experiment. Right. Uh, so if an average consumer was downloading the haptic chatbot app, it was a cool thing at the time. It was right. not a must-have like how ChatGPT might be for many of us today. Uh, if an investor was investing in a business, they were playing the relay, right? They were thinking that, okay, let's see what happens. We don't really know where this is going to go. Or if an enterprise customer was buying our product, uh, it was out of the innovation budget. That, okay, look, let's see, this is our experiment budget and see where that goes. I mean, today, while we're still running the business, all of that has changed. Right? Uh, uh, consumers use various tools every single day, ChatGPT being the most popular. Um, investors, um, as we've been seeing, uh, this is the hottest sector to invest in now. Uh, and biggest change has been in the enterprise, uh, where um, I was just telling Harish while we were talking offline, where it's moved from an innovation experiment budget in the company to an innovation must have budget in the boardroom of the CEO. Uh, and now, at least for us at Haptic, those are the conversations that we're having. Have you, have you in fact, uh, have you seen certain clients come to you with, uh, of course it might have started back in 2013 with you approaching clients, but have you seen now clients coming to you and saying that we need a specific implementation because we want to optimize our costs or improve efficiency and things like that? So we've seen cl clients come to us, but they don't come with a specific implementation. They come and say, I want to do something in Gen AI. Please tell me what I can do. Right. So that's what we are answering for them. 
Right. Um, Harshit, I'll come to you. In fact, uh, you know, as an investor, of course, we were just having this chat outside that how do you as an investor identify certain uh, trends before certain industries? Right now, I, I would probably take a guess that in any pitch that you entertain from anybody, the word AI invariably comes in. So how do you filter that and how do you identify what actually adds value versus what is still probably sort of like a pipe dream? Shaukh, thanks for having me here. Um, certainly you're right, you know, AI is part of every pitch. Sometimes it's a way to increase valuation, but sometimes it's, uh, it's a real thing that uh, companies are building. I think what we look for is, um, do you have a solution that is AI first? Um, you know, many people can infuse AI in different shapes and forms into their existing product, um, and that's great. But one of the things I tend to talk to people about is, AI is one of the first technological e evolutions where there is no real, you know, um, innovator's dilemma for existing companies. So if you see, exist, you know, people across the board have believed that AI is the next technological change. You know, f you know, form Fortune 500 companies down. Everybody's thinking of what's the AI strategy, and so everybody's looking to infuse AI into their their products, right? Um, the question that I tend to ask companies is, are you building something that is uniquely possible today that was not possible? without the advent of this technology? Or are you just infusing AI as a thin layer on top of something that already exists? And if you can answer that compellingly, saying, I am doing something that is very different from what an incumbent is doing, I am able to solve the same problem, but because I'm using AI, I'm doing it so differently that people will come and buy my solution. I think that's far more interesting than saying, hey, I'm solving in the same way, but now I have a layer of automation, or I have a chatbot, or I have something simple on top. Uh, which will make sort of people want to buy a solution. Right. Could you could you probably give us an example of one of the ventures that you've invested in, perhaps, uh, which which suits this definition that you gave? Yeah, I'll give you the example of a company where we've uh, done the seed round. It's a company called Interpret, um, and the company is trying to build a new age Qualtrics. So Qualtrics is sort of you know you know ten billion dollar plus company, SaaS company, and what it does is you know I'm sure all of us have seen a Qualtrics form, which is when you need customer feedback. Typically, companies tend to send a survey. I don't know if you're going to do this after the conference for the attendees, but you send a sort of survey, right? And you know, people have to basically sort of you know, uh, check a bunch of boxes on a form and submit that, right? And that is sort of needed in a world where it's very hard to process a lot of large and disparate data. But now, actually, thanks to LLMs, you should theoretically be able to process custom feedback anytime, anywhere. And what I mean by that is that if you're a company today, you get feedback from your customers on social media, you get feedback from your customers on support tickets that they're writing, you get feedback from your customers when you're selling to them, when you're upselling to them. Your customers are constantly giving you feedback. But the challenge companies have had in the past is that because it's so much data and so unorganized, it's hard for them to sort of distill insights from it. But now, thanks to the power of LLMs, you can actually take all of this data, you can distill it into the few large themes that people are talking about, and you can use that as a far larger sample of what your customers are saying versus something like uh, um, you know, a, a survey form, right? And so if I were to draw the analogy and sort of talk about how they're doing it AI first, they are saying, okay, I'm going to take all of this data and I'm going to give you insight. They are not saying that I'm going to make it easier for you to write survey questions. You know, automating writing a survey question is basically a thin layer, but sort of, you know, actually innovating by changing the approach with which you're collecting customer feedback, solving the same problem, but through a different approach. I think that's interesting and compelling. Right, absolutely. Um, very interesting. Uh, Sudarshan, I'll come to you on that note. Now, you at GoForge, of course, you deal with uh, you know number of clients that you're helping onboard into this entire AI bandwagon, and then there is this new elephant in every room called generative AI, thanks to ChatGPT since 2022. Um, but also for GoForge, there's the question of implementing AI in-house in terms of your own operations. Um, so, does AI help? sort of improve the revenue already in any way, or is it still sort of looking at strategic implementations of AI in probably very niche use cases, or um, okay. how does that? Now, so the whole concept of looking at AI has evolved in the last six to 12 months, right? When ChatGPT broke the scene and it, it became so popular, everybody wanted to put AI in some shape or form, doesn't matter what. Right, but now in the last few months, 
all the clients. So I primarily deal with the banking and financial services, the insurance clients, clients in the travel transport, uh, in retail and healthcare. And across all of these uh, domains, right, the clients are now maturing enough to understand how to actually use AI. And if you condense it to a very simple form, it's a two by two matrix, right? On one side, you have either it is cost optimization or revenue generation. On, on the other axis, you have, you could, do you have the data? Is it, do you have data now or do you have data in the future, right? So you can solve for all of these four. But solving for cost optimization with the data that you have now is the easiest thing to do because you can very tangibly see benefits. For example, in uh, software development in IT, if you use co-pilots or any of the other Gen AI models, you can see an improvement of 10, 20, 30 percent that translates to an FTE save for the clients. And that's what we do want to pass as well. Now, but for a revenue generating concept, that takes a little bit of more time and a bit more value, value uh, vetting, so to say. But overall in this journey, a key aspect that I would see is the data strategy that comes into place, that having the right data foundation and data strategy is critical for any AI to be ready for the enterprise and enterprise consumption. So, so the whole data strategy is something that we are now working with our clients to define it in the right way. Once that is set up, I think the whole next wave of AI can actually come in well. Right, absolutely. Um, Chaitanya, I'd like, now I'd like to come to you. And uh, I remember a couple of months ago, or I think it was a couple of months, when OpenAI Sora uh, sort of hit all the headlines and people were like, oh my god, generative AI can do this and that. Um, I remember you and I had this chat where you said, you know, it's not, like, people need to relax. It's not that moment where AI is going to sort of completely un undo and redo the entertainment industry. Um, on that note, I think you'd also have a slide which I'd request for them to put up. Um, so how do you look at AI in the entertainment industry? Is it something, um, I would assume that in the entertainment industry, AI is really not at that stage which contributes to sort of boosting revenues or helping sort of improve incomes and margins. So where are we in that regard? Um, thank you for having me. In the m and &E industry, if you look at the usage of AI, it is as old as having green screen in a television studio. Computer vision, machine learning, green screen, real-time world replacement is all AI. Right. Right? At, because at this point of time, Gen AI is at the, the peak. If you look at the standard hype cycle, Gen AI is absolute at the peak of inflated expectations. The whole world is running around thinking Gen AI is going to like cure cancer or something like that. Right. None of that is going to happen. Like he said, one of his clients when they came to him, Gen AI right now is a solution looking for a problem. Right. Right? And it, we still don't know what problem it's solving. Yeah, okay, you can do a 60 second video in Sora of a Japanese woman walking in Times Square while it's raining. But what else? It can't really tell a story. That said, AI is now being used in the media and entertainment industry for at least 30 years. If you take something like wire removal, rotoscopy, uh, which is a kind of a VFX workflow, human requirement in doing that is reduced by like 80% in the last three years. Um, if you look at a lot of like Netflix, right, you end up watching two shows, suddenly you'll get a lot of recommendations of those shows coming your way because they have a fantastic uh, inference engine which is tracking your viewing. Uh, you, um, you know, uh, whether you look at silent listening, whether you look at big data, we have a bunch of friends on Facebook with us. You don't interact with somebody, you don't see their post for a long time and you happen to bump into him or her at the airport. You chat for five minutes. You're on your way, he or she is on, on his way. Suddenly their posts start to show up on your phone. How is that happening? It's AI. So, I mean, gen, AI is not just, not just gen AI. From computer vision, machine learning, big data, all this is, is gen AI, right? Do we have that hype cycle slide? Yeah, I think uh, we have the yeah. slide. So, just, uh, go. Gartner does a hype cycle release every year. It essentially tracks technology on five axes. So, 
There's innovation trigger, peak of inflated expectations, trough of disillusionment, slope of enlightenment, and plateau of productivity. And at this point of time, Gen AI is in the absolute peak of inflated expectations. It will come down, it will crash, there will be some normalcy to this scenario, to this situation, right? As you can see, if you look at uh, a, what is just about to enter plateau of productivity as of August last year, it's something that we have, that has already gone through that cycle. So if you go back a few years and track the, the, the movement of uh, computer vision or data labeling or, you know, cloud AI or intelligent applications, you'll see what journey they've gone through. That is the journey that Gen AI will go through, right? Now, to add to that, what our industry, I mean, we don't make anything, we don't build anything. Our products are emotions. So we're selling emotions to people and asking them for money and time. For that, it is an audio-visual narrative experience. Gen AI may still be able to do audio at this point of time. Visual, I'm still not sure, right? Because don't understand framing, composition, a bunch of those things. It definitely can't do narrative. Nothing that we create, write, is actually original. It is a confluence of everything we've seen, heard, watched or read which is then added on to our lived experiences and put through the imagination center of our brain to create that seem, something that seems original. AI doesn't have live ex lived experiences and it doesn't have an imagination center. So there's a lot of kind of everybody's worried about that, oh, AI is going to take away my jobs and all that. Yeah, it will. But a person using AI will take a job of person not using AI. It's not going to do anything. But RPA, repetitive performance activities, intelligent, real-time content creation, AI has been there in our industry for a long, long, long time and it's going to continue to be there, right? I mean, Neuralink, which we all saw a demo of, what, two weeks ago, where this paralyzed man was playing chess. There is some AI involved there as well. Something is telling the computer how to interpret the, the, the neural impulses. So, I mean, sorry, long answer, but yes, it's been there for a long time. It's been used to make a lot of money and it's being used to make good money. Everybody watches the IPL, you see the halftime shows, you see the English Premier League halftime shows, they're well produced. That's a lot of AI. But at this point of time, it is an excellent co-pilot and it will continue to be a co-pilot for a, for a long, long time, right? That is how we look at it. But not a standalone sort of key revenue driver or key income no, driver? I mean, if I'm paying somebody 7,000 bucks a month to do rotoscopy and I have 5,000 of those people and in a year or so I don't need 5,000 of them, I just need 500 of them, then I have saved that money. I am able to do that much faster. So anything which is RPA, repetitive performance activities, yes, we do save money. Right, right, absolutely. You know, the most interesting part of speaking with Chaitanya is you always get a semi-philosophical answer, which is, which is, uh, which is, I think, pretty common in the space of AI. In fact, Harshit, I'd like to also come to you in this regard, that uh, beyond just philosophy and uh, trying to understand what AI is really trying to solve, there's also the question of regulations, which has recently come to the forefront. And, you know, we're discussing what should be allowed in AI, what shouldn't be allowed, the question of responsible AI and explainable AI and so on. Do you as an investor also sort of consider um, these factors when you look at investing in ventures that dabble in AI? You can remove that. I think on, uh, on regulation, I, I think our view is that if companies do the, the right thing, um, you know, regulations will sort of, you know, enable that. So, you know, while you know, AI is a nascent industry, there's sort of been some chatter of, you know, how regulation is going to come about in the sector. We've also seen government efforts to actually promote AI and sort of make India uh, an AI hub, right? There's an investment of over 10,000 crores ma year mark for setting up data centers in India with GPUs, which are sort of the hottest commodity today. They're the sort of the key ingredient that enables AI innovation in India. And so we're seeing policies that enable that. But of course, you know, you've, you know, you've had the problem of deep fakes, those have sort of, you know, been exasperated by some of the stuff that's possible with generative AI. And if you're not, if companies are not careful about sort of, you know, how their products are being used, they certainly can be used to do harm. And you don't want that to happen. So I'd say to the extent that companies self-regulate and think about the impact they're having on society, I think that's going to be a positive. And that's at least what the sort of sense check we use, which is, you know, how are, how are founders thinking about 
you know, using AI for good, what are the guardrails they have in their own products that allow them to be used for the right reasons. And if they do that, we think sort of regulation will sort themselves out over time. Right. Akrit, how do you view this entire space around responsible AI and explainable AI as well? Um, these have been factors which many people have been trying to talk about that. AI algorithms have often been a black box, which makes it a bit of a concern for enterprises to use because you can't always trace it back to the source data and if there are IPs involved in the entire process and so on. So how do you, how do you navigate that as a challenge? Um, when you use uh, cloud servers, do you know where the data goes? Which state in America? Where is it residing? Which server? What they are doing with it? Um, and why I'm sharing that example is, uh, you know, as long as there is enough application of technology, my view is these things um, between the right regulation and the right uh, behavior of customers and consumers, you know, we figure out along the way. So, you know, 10 years back, um, when I had first started Haptic and started meeting customers in India, you know, the standard answer that was at that time was that no bank will ever be using cloud, right? It was very standard at that time that if you're a bank, you're going to be using on-prem for most of your data. Today, the situation is polar opposite, right? Yes, there is on-prem still being used, but everybody is mostly using cloud for a variety of reasons. So I think AI is a similar wave where when you are at the peak of the hype cycle, everything is a little bit more hyped up including items like, okay, how will you regulate? What will happen to privacy? What will happen to data? Uh, how will you ensure that answers are correct? Um, you know, you get reactions like the one you got where suddenly, without anybody knowing, the government announced that every model needs to get approved by us, uh, which then a bunch of us work to, you know, uh, find a way to reverse. So I think, um, um, I feel less worried about that, to be honest. I think that these are things, um, if there's more and more application of the right tech, um, I'm a positive, I have a positive view on the world where everybody will come together and find the right answers. The larger challenge I think what all of us are talking about is what are those sets of applications um, where you can really build deep solutions and products which can have an exponential ROI. Right. Um, before, I, I actually have two questions to this, but before that I'll uh, come to you, Sudarshan. Uh, Akrit mentioned this very interesting thing about the BFSI as a sector and uh, the fact that BFSI has kind of led the sort of IT transformation and digital transformation um, and it's been probably one of the biggest revenue drivers for the entire IT services industry. Um, so it's become this sector which is like pretty sophisticated in terms of tech adoption. Um, and it's kind of probably set an example for other sectors as to what can happen with sort of early, sort of early on the hype cycle tech adoption. Um, at CoForge, do you identify specific verticals? Um, I remember speaking with Sudhir a few months ago where there are certain verticals where you look at which are still probably not on the same train of yeah, tech yeah, adoption. Yeah, of course. You're right that banking and financial services has been at the forefront of innovation. Um, I, of course, there are other areas too, like e-commerce has disrupted in a very meaningful way, but banking has taken a very steady and continuous approach to grow. That continues to be the case with uh, AI and Gen AI adoption as well, right? And uh, so what we see here is even in very specific regulated areas like financial crime, right? Say, typically there's a use case where you have to do negative news screening of institutional clients that they're onboarding. That was a very manual process. We tried to bring in AI six, seven years back. The acceptance from the regulators was not there because it was not mature enough. Now with Gen AI, things have got a lot better. So that acceptance is starting to come in. So the use cases all the way from something like a financial crime to a procurement analytics, where you just scan hundreds and thousands of documents for various legal contracts to see what kind of agreements we have with what kind of vendors and just come up with a quick summary. Genia is helping across the board. But of course, I think to your point on the explainable AI, it's very critical. Like at Kofus, we've got three pillars for AI. One is cognitive, which we all talked about. Second is generative, which we are all trying to figure out what is it that it can actually do. 
third is responsible AI, just to explain what the other two are doing, right? And the whole responsible AI piece uh, cannot be done by just one or two people. Like it will require involvement of the like, companies of Microsoft, Google, AWS, all of them need, we need to work very closely with the providers of the AI infrastructure and AI landscape to be actually meaningfully build out the responsible AI angle. Uh, but of course, all industries are doing well. In fact, even in transport, which you would think that it's very rudimentary, like lorries moving across. Now AI is being used very heavily along with IoT sensors to determine what trucks or lorries can, might break down and what is the optimum route for them to take to improve their productivity. So the use cases are there and they're all going into production. So the, across be it insurance, retail, travel, we are, we are seeing good uh, traction. Right, right, absolutely. Um, Chaitanya, how do you uh, view the concerns around IP being uh, a key part of the data that's used to train AI algorithms? There have been a lot of discussions Artists have raised this question that, okay, what if my artwork, which I might have posted on social media, is scraped by one of the big tech companies and used to train? Is that an infringement of IP? Uh, is that a, a factor that uh, creative professionals are concerned about? Uh, so, yes, and I'll come to that. But just to add on the, on the um, ethical aspect of it. So, um, if you're consuming live stream content in VR at this point of time. Not so much in India because we're not that big a market, but huge in the US, huge in Europe, huge in, huge in other parts of the world. And you've got an award service where it's delivering you advertising along with the live stream concert or sporting event that you're watching. Every single VR headset does something called iris tracking. So it tracks the dilation of your pupil. And ad agencies and CDNs, content management networks, are getting pressure to deliver certain ads when the pupil is dilated X, right? Because when the pupil is dilated more, you're more receptive to content, you're more, it, it impacts you stronger, your purchase, whatever, instinct is, is higher. You don't even know that we are being biohacked. So stuff like this is really what is going to be worrying, right? At this point of time, I don't know if the mobile is doing it. When I'm watching something, I don't know if that small little camera is able to track pupil dilation, but unlikely. But something that's three inches away from my eyes, definitely it can, and it does. So stuff like this, it's, the, it's actually the fourth quadrant. It's the unknown unknown, which is going to come and bite us uh, when you realize that this is happening. Right? So that's one part on the ethical bit that, for example, I'm very worried about. And we want to kind of go, go down that route and make sure that that stuff isn't happening. Now, on the whole IP part, see, and this has been a problem. There are many, many lawsuits happening all across the world. Now, if you take something, uh, a Gen AI model that's built on top of something called stable diffusion, the AI itself doesn't know which images are being sampled to create what seems original. Hence, it can't be copyright. So if you tell the AI to create a, I don't know, half Indian, half Viking superhero who can breathe underwater and it creates something. I don't own it. Nobody owns it. If somebody else wants, they can take the character and make a film out of it. And I can't sue that person. I don't have IP. So, this is one reason why you're not going to be able to use Gen AI to create monetizable, merchandisable IP. On the other hand, if it is just standard casual footage that you want at the background, yes, you will end up using Gen AI a lot, even if it's in a commercial. There are organizations already that are doing very, very ethical and structured Gen AI, like Adobe, for example. Anything you create using Adobe is legal, copyrightable, because it is trained only on their own content. It is trained only on all images that they own entirely. They know where it's come from, they've paid the creators, they've paid the right, they've paid whoever has created it, right? And Adobe is now forming a consortium and they're bringing other people in who have similar uh, stuff. 
so things like this will start to happen you will be able to uh, copyright it you be you will be able to uh, manage the ip right so it's like i said we're, it's still evolving right it's i mean i keep telling people trying to figure out gen ai right now is trying to learn how to ride the bike while the bike is still being put together and it's hard so there will be stumbles but i think we'll figure it out i mean um so that's what i would say right absolutely um harjeet i'll again come to you um in terms of um there was also this mention of uh, the work that big tech does on generative ai and the way it imp impacts smaller startups uh, smaller companies looking to um they have an innovative idea um probably based in india or the southeast asia region um but there's always a concern that big tech with all its might it's of course like the the biggest companies they have far more financial might to power uh, or innovate in ai so to speak um do you think ventures in india would have that kind of opportunity and capital um to work on perhaps a project like the uh, you know like for instance the all you need is attention uh, research paper which led to the transformer model and then chat gpt it's taken billions and billions of dollars is it possible for a smaller venture to um do similar innovation in in today's era i think so i mean it certainly sort of you know takes a very special founder who has you know very special insight uh, one of the things that akim and i were ch chatting about off stage is you know one of the things that exists in america today which is why we see a lot of the innovation there is that there is a very strong research culture um you know they have had universities for the longest time that have had phd programs and research scholarships and the likes and so they actually sort of you know pursue that which is where a lot of these papers that you're mentioning uh whether at the universities or at some of these large tech companies were created um in india we still don't have as much of a research oriented culture i think you know there is a uh, you know um there are the few institutions like iit madras that have you know um very superior programs but in general for the size of you know you know students in india we don't have as deep a uh, research bench and that's similarly true for some of our corporates also where you know doing research like the way google has deep mind um and you know amazon has the equivalent programs doesn't quite exist and so for us to see that from india i think the first sort of you know prerequisite before capital actually is talent and if we can solve for the talent then i'm sure capital will follow because capital will find sort of the best ideas across the world and they will invest but you need sort of the the talent and the idea first right um akrit in fact uh, you are one such startup who has a who's had a i mean 2013 the product and the idea that you had was one of those very innovative ideas that were at the forefront um do you do you think the indian market has ample scope for growth to for you to become maybe like a multi billion dollar organization um so i think two three ways to answer that question so one is or other two three i think sub question so first i guess let's say does um the local market have enough depth uh, to build a very large business uh, either on the enterprise or consumer side i don't think that's clear yet um particularly the uh, concern that i have is uh, especially on the enterprise side look um uh, this technology all said and done and yeah there'll be optimizations along the line but this technology is expensive um so if you're an enterprise who's excited about gen ai and wants to build and invest um you have to be prepared to invest up front um and you know i'm not i'm not going to generalize but uh, unfortunately what tends to happen uh, in indian enterprise software buying typically is sticker shock uh which is that you don't you don't think through what the roi will mean but it's almost like oh wow this is expensive right and the budgets also then flow down accordingly so if that's going to continue to be the view uh then it's hard for any ai startup to build for enterprises in india because this is going to be even more expensive tech more expensive tech in the infrastructure side but also more expensive tech to implement and to get it right and the gestation periods are longer uh if you flip to let it maybe the consumer side 
you know their look uh, whether it is ai or uh, food delivery or uh, uh, hailing a cab or uh, education or edtech the fundamentals lie on the same no gdp per capita how many people are there are you building for tier 1 india tier 2 india so there uh, uh, it's going to be i think less about uh, ai is going to be more about what problem you are solving and how many people are there to buy uh, or pay for it right absolutely you know the i think the best part about ai today is that you can have an endless number of questions and there are always answers and counter answers and counter questions and uh, Did you say that's the best part or the worst part it's uh, depending on which side of the table you're on probably and uh, with that we probably open up the floor for questions uh, we'd like to see if uh, anybody in the audience has questions um, um, can we pass on the mic uh, we can't hear yeah i think that's good now hi uh so my question is more to akrit and then harshjit uh so you know as ai in an, as an industry has moved beyond llms and very recently we've heard of lams large action models as well in the west uh so how soon do you you know see one is it is it practical right is it practical to have like a large action model actually play out globally uh to how soon do we see this being accepted uh, as well and uh, three to harshjit as an investor would you be you know looking at uh, taking a bet anytime soon on you know a, a model like that or you know we would probably wait it out uh, yeah so, so look uh, lams are uh, uh, silicon valley's way of productizing llms right um they it's it's basically taking the underlying science of the model and then stitching it really nicely to then build end to end agents that can fulfill tasks um if i got your question correctly i think what you were asking was how soon can you see lams in action and actually fulfilling tasks or oh, it's happening now uh, it's actually been ha- see LLM agents is basically what LAMs are. So agents have now been happening and in action for what 12, 18 months, fulfilling tasks. Uh, an example I can give you, and I'm talking about more in the US, not so much here. Uh, a good example I can give you, you must check out, is a company called Super AGI, um, which uh, is a completely US-based company, uh, but they have a, they actually have a marketplace of agents. uh where what you can basically do is you can go and say i want to hire a creative designer uh and that agent who represents a creative designer will then come on board and you can give it a bunch of tasks that hey listen make this image make that image you could do that for a customer support agent you could do that for uh, um you know a finance and accounting agent and so on so um llm agents have now existed for a while which are we are now calling lams Uh, and absolutely i think uh, uh, they will add a lot of value we're not seeing so much of it in india uh, which is a larger problem that we were all talking about on your question on sort of you know would this be something that's an interesting investment opportunity i'd say the answer is yes um so you know one perhaps the best funded sort of you know generative ai company today is a company called sarvam uh, which is building indic language llms the problem that they are trying to solve is twofold one is that you know when you look at global models the amount of data that they have in indian languages and what they are trained on is far lesser and so if you are able to collect proprietary data you can actually build more sophisticated models and the second is that you know you need to have very high efficiency in india for anything to be deployed at population scale so you know if open ai charges you you know x cents um you know per token you basically need that to be far lower in india for you to see uh, the same evolution right and so that's a company that you know basically raised you know very large seed round uh, pre launch um, you know we were um, we let that round and they subsequently raised the series a as well on the back of uh, the first model that they put out and so i think again you know if there are very smart founders who have very interesting ideas the capital will certainly come um, you know generative ai and ai in general is a team that's top of mind for most investment companies across the globe and so the capital will follow uh, if there are some interesting companies being built 
do we have any oh, we do have uh, at least two questions could we hello yes um go ahead please uh, hello. take your yeah uh as the gentleman said uh, uh, ai is at the peak of its hype you know hype cycle gen ai gen ai basically. within ai within, within ai, AI perfect perfect so uh, very recently elon musk said that within the next 4 or 5 years ai probably would uh, take over you know human intelligence in several of the sectors if not all so how how do you see this statement you know playing out so i mean uh, okay i give a funny answer are, are we really that intelligent sorry are we really that intelligent so if ai is as intelligent as, as us Mm -hmm. it will make a lot of mistakes anyway mm -hmm. somebody has to fix those mistakes right Absolutely. to wo hum kar lenge just kidding but so if you look at intelligence actually again sorry to get into philosophy but if you break that down right what is that what when we say intelligent what are we doing it's inferring it is a lot of uh, you know analysis organizing those kind of things right. which it's already doing a lot of your left brain what you historically would call left brain is been done by the ai cv ml trio right so there isn't that much worry about that right and elon especially has a unique way of approaching things which is good because i mean i remember when the when initially he was talking about tesla his approach was that all the other auto manufacturers were trying to make a car smart he was trying to build a safe computer on wheels right so it's also about approaching it so he approaches it differently which is fine but it's already doing a lot of the the intelligent stuff which is okay the the bigger problem for gen ai will be that it doesn't have opinions as of now and everything is opinion because you approach everything from your point of view it doesn't have a point of view it only has a collection of data correct right so that that gap between information and knowledge or between knowledge and wisdom that will always remain and that is where really we come in true uh, and it will always be so i'm not so worried about that right but now for example if you look at gen ai what i am worried about is um is the lack is the potential lack of um standard deviation in content now let me explain what that means a little complicated so for example if you if there are 100 people here and we all type generate a dog it will generate 100 different dogs right now that goes back into the same data pool that is that the gen ai is learning on up to this point of time it's learned on data pool which has been created by real human artists so it's got much more variety but as gen ai starts to be used to create more and more and more images at an exponential scale the data pool itself will start to get muddied because you can't tell it learn from this but don't learn from this so gen ai created images are going back into the data pool which the learning uh, engine is learning from and as more and more and more of that happens you may get the dog created much faster but the standard deviation of what 100 dogs look like will start to reduce and reduce and reduce and reduce so the bigger challenge is going to be how do you fix or how do you tweak the training of gen ai so as to continue to get very diverse results now these are problems that are a little way a little ahead of a future down the road but they are problems so this is the kind of stuff that we need to start thinking about now it's a tool it's a great tool but we have to use it well and there is the approach on the the two way approach right so how, how do we use ai to make our life better but what do we need to do to make ai better so that second approach also now starts to come into the picture and there you have ethics and various things that that come in right so there's something called tris t r i s m in ai which is trust risk and it's like a acronym so a lot of that will start to come in thank you um could we pass on the mic 
Hi, uh, my name is Sudarshan. Uh, I work with TCS uh, in AI.cloud. So the point that you brought up about uh, you know, uh, content being uh, put back into the web is a very important thing which a lot of people don't talk about. Uh, so the difference, uh, I'll just add one point, the difference between AI and Gen AI, and a lot of people you know, kind of get some ox by this, is that AI helps make better decisions, Gen AI helps create new content, new data. Right? So this, this data, uh, you know, how good is it, <coughs> how authentic is it, how, uh, you know, harmless is it, you know, all these questions are going to come up also for responsible AI. And uh, so there are ways, uh, maybe if one of you would like to, you know, talk more about this, uh, watermarking of AI images, already there are consortiums that are saying that if, you must have read about the Musk controversy, the fake ad came on YouTube and, you know, you're trying to dilute the web, which is very harmful because the web is an open medium and regardless of open AI or uh, what is actually closed AI, you know, uh, you know, it should remain open. Uh, the other thing which I wanted to talk about, and this question is to all of you, is the way uh, data transparency is going to play a role. So, uh, the EU AI Act, which will probably be the you know, cornerstone for other legislation which will kick in uh, in US and maybe India also, says that the, uh, you, you need to declare uh, what data your model has been trained on. Otherwise, we won't allow the model. That's what they're saying now. I don't know what they'll do. Uh, so that's one thing which is going to weigh very heavily on the you know, AI providers or the Gen AI providers. And the other worrying thing which I see is that uh, there was this case in which uh, some court in the US said that uh, stable, uh, uh, the AI doesn't own the copyright for the image created by stable diffusion, right? So then that raises the other, dusri taraf ka question, then who owns the copyright? You Nobody. Know? Ah, so if I create something, my company creates something using Gen AI, somebody else it. will use it and say, aapka copyright to thai nahi is pe. Correct. Right? So, uh, so there are ways, you know, they opt out and you know, there are ways of, even people who are, I think there's something called, have I been trained, where you can actually check whether, you know, your work has been used. And th like you said, it's a very open thing. But uh, I just want to hear from some of you or all of you about how you think, you know, transparency and authorship is going to play out uh, not just in India, because India will follow, you know, what US and Europe is doing. Last so, I think, uh, Sudarshan, maybe you can start. Sure. So, yeah, so I think related topic, right, there was, there was a, a airline which had given an offer with their chat bot and… The Air, ca Air Canada, yeah, February Air Canada, last exactly. month, yeah. And then eventually there's a case which is going on and they need to own up. So, these things do happen. I think it's a very nascent uh, market for AI, right, and that will evolve. Eventually, the ownership will be allocated. I think that's the need of the R. Like you said, EU is coming up with the policy. All countries need to come up with the right data policy and AI policy for them to, for people to actually streamline, right? But the ownership is very critical and slowly now it is pointing towards whoever is owning. For example, the models are set up, a company owns it. Similarly, an AI is also a model that the company has. So, so that ownership is there. Beyond that, again, this, there's been a lot of work happening with the likes of OpenAI, Microsoft, Google to just make sure that transparency and explainability comes in at the forefront. Because without that, we'll not be able to use uh, models meaningfully uh, for a long time. Right. So explainability on LLMs is one of the things that uh, I, I mean, my team works on. So Anthropic has something. Uh, we can talk after the discussion. Uh, so they are working on explainability of language models. Uh, because traditional explainability for AI is okay -ish. I mean, it's not fantastic, but it's okay. But for LLMs, it's a different game altogether because it's uh, dealing with language, dealing with tokens, right? So it's, yeah. it's a very different, you're not dealing with... Um, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, we should catch up off. I have on one this. question also. So, if OpenAI, if ChatGPT is going to be a less intelligent version of Wikipedia, we are not really sure whether what's coming is true or no. How long will the trust remain? Like we have a thousand students on campus. We, when they join, we tell them don't use Wikipedia. Half of it is wrong. But still some of them will cheat and use it. And then they get caught because what they're writing is wrong. Right? Given the debacle of Bing, given that hallucinations on open, on chat GPT are going up and up and up, not down. I, I don't see this trust factor becoming even close to 100% anytime soon. So, 
I think that's another problem that, that the AI industry needs to fix. Like banks did, banks started trusting the cloud and they didn't need to do on-prem stuff. The world needs to have that equation with, uh, gen with AI content. And according to me, at this point in time, I mean, we don't, I don't. The media and entertainment industry has at best 50% uh, confidence and whatever, bharosa and trust in uh, content that is generated. So I think that's another problem. I don't know if we all have Akrit, similar probably, issues wanna and want to talk about that. This. My question. Yeah, I mean, uh, you're, you're spot on. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, along with uh, being at the peak, we're, you know, I think we should caveat one thing with Gen AI, right? That it is probably the fastest technology to go from launch to peak. So we sometimes forget how early it is, right? Because we're all so excited about it and, um, you know, ironic. I was telling my wife last night, uh, not in this context, but in gen some other context that I've reached a point where I'm tired of talking about AI, you know? Um, so because the both, it's very early, right? We sometimes forget how early it is. Um, and I honestly credit due where it's due to the likes of OpenAI, where even in, you know, it was the fastest product ever in the world to reach 100 million users. Um, so it's, it's, it's way too early and we should take a step back and say that, look, it's okay, it's 50%. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm saying it's good, it's 50%, right? In one and a half years, it's 50%, that's amazing. Uh, it took cloud, what, 10 years to get there by the time we were even somewhat okay with it. So it'll take time and um, 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 as long as there's enough consumption, enough usage and enough value that we are seeing and it's increasing, which 100% I am seeing, I think as an investor lens, uh, they would be able to say, um, you know, uh, Sequoia US uh, had a very interesting AI event recently, all the videos are up, you must see it, right? Uh, where they've quantified the value generation we're seeing so fast. As long as that is happening, we'll get there. Right. Um, Harshit, what role do, does, a, does, a, does a VC like yourself play in trying to define the value of AI and AI startups today? Because as uh, Akrit mentioned, we're still at a very early stage of generative AI. So how do you define what a generative AI startup's value is today? The question is, you know, what type of impact you see and, you know, how many industries you think it will disrupt, right? I think the, um, the view is that, you know, when sort of, you know, so, you know SaaS came out or cloud came about, it disrupted software. And that was sort of, you know, 300 billion odd of spend. And so, you know, when SaaS came out, it expanded the market. But that was sort of, you know, the, the addressable market that disrupted. I think with generative AI, you know, Basically, you know, every industry is going to change and evolve in many different ways, and therefore, the expectation that you know generally investors have is that the time of companies is going to be significantly larger, and consequently, there could be you know trillions of market cap that will sort of you know get dislodged, and that will create the opportunity. Now, you know, will that happen tomorrow? Absolutely not. But you know, if you take a sufficiently long view, will that happen? Perhaps, because I think many of the problems that we are talking about are real problems. Uh, but if you think about sort of, you know, the technological innovation that has allowed us to create the stuff that we are seeing, it's pretty phenomenal, right? Like, you know, it's hard to imagine that, you know, you know computers could be creative, uh, and that's not something people would have imagined. It's not, it's hard to imagine that computers would have reasoned, and that was something that people didn't believe in. And so I think, you know, if you believe those things have happened in the last few years, and now with, you know, some of the smartest people in the world working on this and all the capital available to it, do we think that some of these problems will get solved? I would venture that the answer is probably yes. Right, absolutely. Do we have any other questions no, in the audience? One quick or? point. One thing that uh, we gen you gentlemen didn't talk about, which I would love to hear about later, is ROI on AI. Okay, so that's <coughs> one thing that we have a handle on. <coughs> We're working on this. And uh, really, open AI is actually more expensive than the you know, open source providers is uh, the belief in many places. So, you know, maybe... Uh, we, Bot we should bottom of the pyramid, huge benefits. So right. uh, RPA, repetitive performance activities, huge benefits, especially in media and entertainment, I'm sure in others as well, right? But as you move up, so worker, manager, creative manager, ideator, as you move up that pyramid, I have a feeling the value and the impact, financial impact will go lower and lower and lower. 
Okay, that's interesting. Uh, Thank Sudarshan, you. Sudarshan, would we want to add and on finally, that? Finally, uh, I think uh, in this, all open AI and there are large language models. Uh, the market will slowly evolve to more of the smaller language models, right? Where it's very focused on specific use cases. They are also capitally less intensive, but also easier for us to train and maintain and and groom. So that way, the ROI also will be better for owning the API and maintaining it. Plus, of course, I agree that open source LLMs have performed a lot better than proprietary LLMs in uh, specific use cases. And you really don't need 192 billion tokens to actually run your models. Right, absolutely. And uh, I think with that, we'll uh, wrap up this uh, very interesting uh, panel discussion. We still have four minutes and 40 seconds. So we'll use that, in fact, to answer or to get an answer on this very uh, this question that, that has been asked a lot of times, and uh, I honestly don't know what to think of it, if it's science fiction or, will AI take all our jobs and maybe some one day kill us also? Um, we'll begin with you, Harshi. I, I, I don't believe so. I think, you know, people have thought that every time there's been a fundamental transformation of technology, uh, that people will become redundant and, you know, computers will take our jobs. I don't think that's going to be the case. I think the, what is going to happen is that services that would have been restricted to, you know, you know, smaller section of population will get available to everybody. So I think standard of living overall will move up. Uh, and I'm excited to see that. But I don't think we are all going to be jobless, or I hope not. Right. Akrit, what about you? We've, in fact, I think we touched upon AGI, and there's been a lot of debates around defining what is general intelligence and artificial general intelligence. Do you think, uh, you know, we have Skynet somewhere roaming around in the vicinity? Uh, I think investors will definitely have a job. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I've been, I've been answering this question for a decade, right from when we started Haptic. My standard answer for the better part of nine years has been what Harshid mentioned for the last part. And also this you know, and the technology Silicon Valley notion that every technology evolution moves us forward, nobody will lose jobs, nothing will happen. Um, being very candid, you know, my, I'm not sure anymore. Um, I, I, do, I do see a medium term impact on jobs. I do see that there will be certain jobs that will become redundant. Um, I, I, I think, um, um, Wherever you have, I feel like the first layer is going to be, actually funnily, I don't think, it, everybody thinks that the BPO industry will go away. I don't think it necessarily that. I think the first jobs that will be impacted most are where you are assisting somebody at their task. Paralegal, um, writer, um, designer who's building something for somebody else. Uh, I think those are ones... Uh, which will have the first degree of impact. And if you think about some of the new agents that are coming out, I think shortly we'll see impact on some second degree jobs as well. Um, you know, a common question I get in, uh, in a lot of my uh, personal, social sort of friends and family circle is, how should we think about what we teach our kids now? Right? Should they be studying structured engineering problems? Or should they be thinking about open-ended creativity? And I don't have that answer either. Um, I do think AGI is not very far away. But I also think that anybody who knows what, the means is, what, what it means is kidding themselves, including what I think OpenAI says, we'll, we don't know what it's going to mean. And that's partly the scary part. Right, absolutely. One one-minute answers from you, gentlemen. Uh, Sudarshan. I think uh, I would hope as an AI practitioner that AI takes some of the low-end jobs, right? Definitely that needs to happen as with any revolution. Jobs need to go and new jobs need to be created. And the way things are shaping up, there will be more opportunities than what will go away. Right? So, so the whole things about monitoring, regulating, then working on top of what AI has done. In terms of real intelligence of what AI can do, there's immense potential, but of course, what is coming out to the public and what is used as a general usage for day-to-day -day life is going to be very different. Chaitanya, we'll wrap so, with you. 
Yeah, AI is not taking anyone's job, but a person using AI will take the job of a person not using AI. That's right? an interesting take. So that's simple. And with that fantastic line, it's uh, we draw to a close our panel on AI and its role in our present and our future. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being a part of this, and thank you. Thank you.